He cares for those who trust him. But with an overwhelming flood, he will make an end of Nineveh. He will pursue his foes into darkness. So with this in mind, if if we have a God that is so in love with his people, but a God that must dispense justice on that which is against who he is, that which provokes and hurts his holy mind, we have this tearing in the heart of God. Do Do you see it with me? There must be a tearing in his heart. Do you get that? We have this divine dilemma. Please do not let us attempt to make ourselves above this assessment of humanity. You see, it's our way, it's a contemporary way to say that we are far better as people than those of the past. That's the Ninevites. They, ooh, yeah, that is disgusting. We don't do that type of thing today. Oh, and the Israelites, yeah, they, they were ancient, but we're educated now. We're, we're good people. We, we, we're so great. We're, we're an amazing people. We, we're in the 21st century. Sin doesn't exist today. It was something of the past. I'm going to read a quote to you by a man called Michael Green. Um, a book very graciously bought to me that has helped me. Amazing. See, the heart of the problem is the human heart. All over the world, it is very far gone from original righteousness. We have broken God's laws. We have come short of his standards. We have rejected his love. We have kept him out of our lives. We have put all our idols before him. We in our generation are exceedingly smug about ourselves. We are confident that basically we are all all right. And yet this generation, above all others, is raping the earth squandering non-renewable resources, fouling the environment and resting very satisfied that one third of the world is overfed while the other two thirds are in need and over 30,000 people across the world starve to death every day. Ours is the generation of genocide and torture unparalleled in the history of the world and it has largely taken place amongst the most civilized of nations. Don't think we're not wrapped up in this. Our heart is the problem. We have a heart problem, people, and God knows that. Sin is what we are, not what we do. Sin is a state of heart. Sin is the fact that there is just a distance between us and God. There's a distance of of relationship. There's a distance of guilt. We know we're guilty. And so there's this huge distance and it's not what you, you, whenever you speak to someone about sin, don't, don't say it's because you do this, it's because you do this. It's because in our hearts as humans, we've all chosen to reject God. And that makes us far from him. So we come to this point again. He loves inexplicably, but he must be just. You understand the sinfulness of man cannot go unpunished. So we come to my second thing, that the cross here, It is finished. This whole series, 72, is about the three days that changed the world. But on each of these three days, there are three three three-word statements that grasp all that is taking place. Last week in his trial, we hear Pilate saying these words, what is truth? And those three words, in a sense, ask the question and, 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 and state the whole course of that passage. What is truth? Is truth that God would die for man? Is truth that you are God being treated unjustly, being beaten and being accused of wrongdoing, but you yourself are perfectly innocent because you're God? What what is truth? And today, as we look at the dying God-man, Jesus Christ hanging upon a Roman cross, we hear him say these three words, it is finished. I believe these three words say all that ever needs to be said. In the Greek, in fact, it's only one word. In the Greek, it's one word. And that one word holds the fundamental truth that all the other words said in all of time would never be able to express. That one word that means for us in three words, it is finished. It would take all the other words in all of history to explain what Jesus was saying in those three words. But don't know if you're like me. The way, the way I am is when I see a statement like that, It is finished. I immediately have a question, and I think we all need to have a question this morning. What is finished? What's finished? 
Why was Jesus saying these words? What has taken place in the death of Jesus? What's happened here? If Jesus says, it is finished, why is he saying that? What is it that's finished? And this is the most wonderful truth you'll ever, ever get to understand. Listen to these words by Charles Spurgeon again. What's finished? He persevered in holy obedience three and 30 years. That obedience cost him many a pain and a groan. Now it is about to cost him his life. And as he gives away his life to finish the work of obedience to the Father and of reconciliation for us, he says, it is finished. It was a wonderful work even to look at. Only infinite love would have thought of devising such a plan. It was a wonderful work to carry on for so long. Only limitless patience would have continued at it. And now that it requires the offering of himself and the yielding up of his earthly life, only a divine savior, the very God of very God, would or could have finished it by the surrender of his breath. What a work it was, yet it was finished. We have begun to do something for Jesus that would bring him a little honor and a little glory, but often we never finish it. Yet it has never come to anything. But Christ's work, which cost him his heart, his soul, his body and spirit, cost him everything. Even his death on the cross. He pushed through all. He pushed through everything until it was accomplished. Until he could say, it is finished. Listen to these three verses. Because I think they speak volumes of truth in support of these words that Jesus has just said. Jesus is on a cross and he says these words, it is finished. There was a reason he went to the cross. There was a purpose in God's heart. The Bible says it was before all time. He says he's the lamb of God slain before the foundations of the world. God knew that this moment would come. Listen to these verses from scripture. Galatians 3 verse 13. Christ has rescued us from the curse pronounced by the law. When he was hung on the cross, he took upon himself the curse for our wrongdoing. That's Galatians 3, 13. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 18 and 21. And all of this, everything we've received is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. For God made Jesus, God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. Do you see what's happening here? What's finished is that God is finding a way to restore relationship with rebellious, sinful, self-centered man, but maintain his holiness. He cannot let sin go unpunished. He cannot just watch a rapist do what he does and say, no problem, I can't do a thing about it. He must do something about it. We want a God that does something about that, don't we? We want a God that punishes what is wrong. We need that, or else our world would be in disarray. But there must be Someone who takes their punishment. And that is what the cross is. Romans 8 verse 32. He did not even spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. 1 Peter 1 verses 18 and 19. For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And the ransom he paid was not gold or silver. It was the precious blood of Jesus the spotless lamb of God. I'll tell you what is finished. I'll tell you what is being said in those three words. Here, through the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ, fully God and fully man, on the cross, our holy God remains the holy God that he is, while providing a way of forgiveness and restoration of relationship at the inexplicable cost of the sacrificing of his own son. 